Welcome back to the Great Compromise Podcast. If you caught our last few episodes, then you'll be excited to hear that Jim and I are back together for this one. We're back! And today we're going to be learning about safe injection sites. So, what are safe injection sites? They're places where people can use drugs, namely narcotics, in a safe place so there are protections against deadly overdoses. In addition, the word safe in this context includes a few things. First being sterile supplies. Injection equipment includes syringes, sterile cookers, filters, and tourniquets. Facilities that offer these provisions do not supply or inject clients with IV drugs. Second, it's a secure environment, free from criminal prosecution. Small open booths keep clients in view of clinicians. Legally sanctioned facilities are exempt from prosecution for having illicit drugs on the premises. And, of course, life-saving support. Clinicians on staff are equipped with crash kits to respond immediately to an overdose. Let's first get a little bit of background on safe needle sites. These are also called drug consumption rooms or DCR rooms. These are supervised injection sites, and according to my research, they started opening in the 90s. They could first be found in Switzerland, now in Germany and the Netherlands too. These spaces were not widely approved of, and many more were planned but never even allowed to open their doors because the public didn't accept the idea of allowing addicts to consume their drugs. It felt like condoning the practice, even encouraging it. The lack of acceptance of these programs comes at a very human cost though, as when they're in place, many deaths from overdose are prevented. Let's dig a bit deeper. Yeah, you were just talking about how some of these these facilities were never even opened because of the public backlash to them. Right. And so here's where I come clean. <laughs> uh, this episode was initially going to be a debate episode where Victoria was pro and I was con injection sites. Until it came time to do more research, and I decided that these sites are actually good. Um, I think without knowing much about them, it's easy to say that they encourage drug use or increase crime in the area. But there's really very little evidence to suggest they do anything except save lives. I mean, there's what, around 120 of these sites worldwide across 10 different countries? That's pretty good. I mean, they're new in America, relatively speaking. It, it, it seems bad at face value. I can definitely understand why people don't like the idea of them. I was one of those people. But um, I think if you are one of those people, it's good to keep an open mind and maybe do a little research and listen to what we have to say on the topic. Yes, because I've done research for us all. (laughs) Which is perfect. (laughs) So, as it is today, we have drug consumption rooms in Denmark, Canada, and Australia. The U.S. opened two sites last November in New York City, in East Harlem, and Washington Heights. Plenty of places are not condoning safe needle sites, including all of the U.K., which, as we just said, is based on face value. There's a lot of people against it. For example, we can dive into what Canada has done to give a little bit of context. So in Canada, supervised injection sites were contentious, but they were met with drug user-led activism, which I think is pretty unique. Hmm. Addicts fought for a safe consumption site. This led to the government approving of a pilot program with addiction services under the same roof, mandated scientific evaluations done on the impact of this program. And this research has led to a ton of positive benefits and zero deaths. So no increase or encouragement of drug use was found. Fatal overdose rates decreased sharply in and even around the immediate area of the site. There were less deaths, less risky behaviors that led to HIV infections, and clients were more likely to initiate detox from drugs and access to treatment like getting methadone compared to those who didn't use the facility. 
it's not exactly a secret that there's an opioid crisis in this country and not just America, but, well, you know, I wouldn't say worldwide, but it's possible it's worldwide. 68,000 people died from opioids in 2020. So I think that it's important to remember that while we're talking about this issue. We've tried just about everything else to fight this, and 68,000 people are still dying from overdoses. That, I mean, that number alone helps me keep an open mind about this issue and how to combat this. And I want to talk about, in my opinion, and what I learned in this research and over my many years of experience, what is the, (laughs) don't laugh, what is probably the best way to combat the opioid crisis, at least hypothetically. Number one, that would be limiting inappropriate use of prescription opioids, right? That's where a lot of people start their addictions. They get a prescription from the doctor and then they get hooked, right? Mm -hmm. At first it's legit. And then it gets out of hand. Exactly. It's very easy to become addicted to opioids. Number two would be reducing the flow of illicit opioids like heroin. Law enforcement has been trying that. We've been working on it. It can only go so far, but it's still important to do, right? Number three, helping people seek treatment for opioid misuse. That is happening. It's not happening enough. We still don't see addiction as a uh, as an illness, right? We see it as... Um, I think we yeah. say we see it as an illness, and then we still drug people, judge people that are addicted to drugs, exactly. right? Like, yeah. there's still a lot of taboo. An incredible amount, um, which is why we can't open safe injection facilities. But number four would be deploying harm reduction tools that blunt the risks of death, illness, or injury, which would be a safe injection site or a needle exchange program or some of these other things. So it's these four steps all in conjunction working together to lower or stop the number of these deaths that just don't need to happen, Mm -hmm. right? And so this fourth step that the safe injection sites are a part of are important and they're kind of a new idea. This isn't something that we've thought about for a long time. It's 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 new and why not try it, right? It it saves lives. Um there's no reason not to do it. You have to use all these things together to beat it. Speaking of addiction being a disease, I'd like to go over the neurology of addiction and what's really occurring in the brain of an addict. So meth pushes our dopamine levels up more than 10 times what the normal dopamine levels in our brain should be. Weed, alcohol, and heroin all drive up our dopamine in a part of the brain that makes the rest of life pale in comparison. So dopamine drives us to get food, water, survive. In general, an addiction overrides all of our natural impulses And because it makes everything else feel so pathetic in comparison, it changes our brain chemistry, especially over time. So over time, the dopamine hit from a drug is less powerful. It becomes habituated, making higher doses of the drug necessary to feel that same high, which is where overdose can come into play. It's really dangerous when you start increasing the amount of drug without supervision. Without the drug at all, the dopamine levels in the brain of an addict drop to the floor, making it hard to get out of bed, hard to do anything. So without the brain chemistry helping someone function naturally, without any drive to work or eat or take care of themselves without being high, do we need to be punishing addicts and criminalizing things? Should we criticize them and shame them? Or is this someone that needs help in a compassionate way? so that we can fight the stigma and encourage them to battle this crippling addiction while doing what we can to help them simply stay alive through that process. Mm -hmm. And I think once we can understand it from that perspective, the safe needle sites become imperative. I think I actually agree with you. (laughs) I really like that for a change. Yeah, I know. It is nice to hear that. 
it's um I think sites like these are, are an important tool, honestly. And I think they're a good step in the direction of having the majority of people actually believe that this addiction is an illness that needs to be treated and not to stigmatize these people. Having these facilities may change public perceptive, public perception, rather. Yeah, and in my research, there was one story where they interviewed this guy who was using a safe needle site, I think in Denmark, Mm -hmm. and they asked him about his experience, and he said that using the safe needle sites made him feel safer because he had a friend who had been passed out after using drugs in an alley, and not to be super graphic, but basically he survived such a violent act that it would have been better not to survive. He was set a fire by somebody. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, and so since addicts are so looked down upon, it's like they can be easily mistreated. How many times do we, you know, judge the homeless or not trust that they're going to take the, you know, donation that they're asking for and use it wisely, right? There's all these examples of how people in this state are actually at risk of not being treated well. Mm -hmm. And these sites are a place for them to also feel safe and then more literally be kept alive. Whether we like it or not, every city and a lot of towns in America are already unsafe injection sites, right? And so... It's going to be happening whether we like it or not. It is currently illegal and still just as easy to get. And so having these sites to at least prevent unnecessary deaths, they're going to be injecting drugs no matter what. And so if we keep them from dying, it is still a victory in the hopes that they can recover one day. And these sites actually do lead people to at least try to recover. Yeah, there are a ton of benefits from these sites in ways that they work. It's a place for clients that use these sites to experience social acceptance for a change Mm -hmm. because the staff aren't judgmental and they're welcoming. They're not going to preach at them. They're going to let them do what they would naturally be doing without any protection and take it as a chance to educate them on safe practices and hygienic practices and... Um, correct doses and stuff like that, but without like judging them or forcing treatment down their throat, which actually makes them way more open to treatment as they form like really good bonds with people who are living unaddicted lives. It makes that more appealing. Mm -hmm. Plenty of people don't know anyone that's not in their circumstance, right? Like we all tend to exist in our echo chambers. And so having healthy relationships with somebody who's not judging you and who wants to help you without any strings attached is an incredible tool alone. So personally, I've worked at both crisis centers for people in domestic violence relationships and also as a case manager in an adult mental health um, clinic. So I've been surprised in my work to see how much a neutral sounding board really impacts the clients. So if I feel like I'm not doing enough for them and I'm just sitting there listening to them and not judging them and having like a compassionate ear that can bring up a ton of emotion from someone who is going to a methadone clinic to try to stay clean to earn back custody of their children. Like the fact that I'm not telling them they're wrong or should be ashamed and just like encouraging them on their way can be like really powerful for someone in a way that I never expected before I had that job or being at the crisis center and talking to people who were like addicts and just trying to get out of an unsafe situation but didn't have a lot of options and maybe they'd been cut off from their family leaving them with even less options and all the shame of it like so many people just don't talk to people in their lives because they're expecting the judgment they're expecting either distance put in place after they share or some kind of forced reaction you know like you definitely need to get into treatment so I think that these safe injection sites make so much sense to me and 
in my research, I read all about how the staff at these sites prevent overdoses by educating and intervening when necessary. If there are problems, they're going to refer their clients to a medical clinic. But not only are they there for the medical part of it, but they're going to be another non-judgmental force that actually want to make sure that these people are taken care of. So building those relationships means that if they're having a problem, they can come to the staff, right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to be open and sharing the truth with a lot of people in their lives, or they don't even have someone that they could come to with that. So this provides someone that they can trust and even go to if they don't have that. Then the staff also connects clients to drug treatment programs and services in both social and health fields as needed. So that could be a psychiatrist, someone to diagnose a mental illness or help them with the treatment um, to become clean. And then lastly, the promotion of accepting their clients creates a path for both prevention and treatment of overdoses, referrals to healthcare, drug treatment centers, and social services. And I've also heard about instances where this can even lead to helping people find jobs and better living circumstances. So these can really be like beneficial connections to make someone motivated to not just become clean, but stay clean. And that's huge. Right. It's so much better than a prison sentence, right? Like Or being dead on the street. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It, that is an enormous benefit. Even after hearing all of that, and after doing all the research I have done, it's just something about it makes me feel uncomfortable, right? Something about the government providing sites where people can do drugs. It's very uh, Brave New World, and it just, it makes me feel uncomfortable. No matter how much I understand the logic of how these sites work and they save lives. Like, I understand all of that logically, but something inside me is still very uncomfortable about it. And I know I am not the only one. That's why there's been so much public backlash. But it doesn't really matter how I feel about it, right? Because we know they work. And yeah, it is important to change public perception. But like, at, at some point, it's about saving lives. And maybe we should just start doing it before the public is ready to accept it. I think a big part of that is that it's so normal for a change of course to feel wrong or scary, mm. but that doesn't mean it's a bad idea, right? If something doesn't feel typical, then it's unnatural and wrong, but that's not true. That's just like fear talking. And maybe that's what it is. It's unfamiliar because it's not a common practice, mm. but research shows that it saves lives and isn't that what's most important? It is. That is exactly what matters in this scenario. And it, I talk about the four steps of combating this crisis, and this is an important one. I, I am for it. I, I am. But I can't shake that uncomfortable feeling, and I think that will take some time to do. Totally understandable. But if it makes you feel any better, the two safe needle sites that have been opened in New York City since last November already have intervened in over 125 overdoses among over 640 users. So that's over 125 lives saved just in the matter of months. That's great. That's great. We can't discount that. I mean, there's, there's really no argument against that. They saved 125 lives. And with more to come, I, I can only assume. And that's probably not even the most recent number. So that's pretty good. Probably. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly. I think that harm reduction as a tactic in general is really helpful. The safe needle sites, clean needle exchanges are all like along the same line of not shaming people or denying the inevitable, right? In some percentage, we're going to have addiction in society. And so we can criminalize it and get angry about it, or we can get compassionate and try to do what we can on many different levels. So I think this is an important component, like we've been saying, to reduce harm, but also danger, right? Like with these safe injection sites, we're not going to be finding needles on streets and playgrounds. That's been proven. 
And our great compromise this week is that we agree. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great compromise. It's our biggest yet. That's true. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The Great Compromise. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Tell your friends, drop a like, and we will see you next week.